I'm Alan Boyle, President of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. And I wanted to mention that we have a special tradition at CASW that we established in 2013. It's called the Petrosky Lecture. And uh, this annual lecture at the New Horizons in Science Briefings honors Ben Petrosky, who served as CASW's executive director for 25 years and as program director for New Horizons for 30 years. Since then, we've heard from award-winning chemist George M. Whitesides, paleoanthropologist Don Johansson, biologist and science policy official Joe Handelsman, physics Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg, and Gates Foundation CEO Susan Desmond Hellman. This year's Petrusky Lecturer carries on what's now a truly traditional tradition. Shirley Tilgman is a mammalian developmental geneticist who gave a New Horizons talk with the title of Mammalian Gene Wars back in 1996. She served as Princeton University's president between 2001 and 2013, and she's now returned to teaching. Along with leading scientists Bruce Alberts, Judith Kimball, and Harold Varmus, Dr. Tilgman is engaged in a project called Rescuing Biomedical Research, which advocates reforming America's research system to boost innovation and basic science. Today's talk, entitled Systemic Flaws in the Biomedical Research Enterprise, touches on the challenges facing the biomedical research community and offers some solutions to those challenges. This kind of high-level view of a scientific field with an eye toward advancing that field makes for the perfect Petrusky Lecture. Part of the tra tradition for the Petrusky Lecture is the award of a certificate and this Petrusky prism to mark the occasion. Here it is in all its glory. Uh, Dr. Tilbing, I, I, I'd love you to come out and accept this addition to your trophy shelf. And uh, I think it'll fit in your bag to take back to Princeton. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We got this. Here we go. Don't knock over the prism, Alan. <laughs> ah, there thank we you. go. That's lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. You bet. Thank you That'll very be much. Right for you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am delighted to be here to give um, the sixth Petrusky lecture, and and I want to begin with why I am here, my motivation for being here, and that is uh, as an opportunity to thank all of you here in the audience. For those of, who, of us who have spent our lives conducting science, we know how absolutely critical the work that all of you do in helping to interpret, to understand the work that we are doing, and most importantly, I think, putting the work into a broader social context. Without you, uh, we would simply not have the means uh, to do the important work of explaining the science to the larger uh, public. So most importantly, I'm here to thank all of you. Um, the title of this Petrusky uh, lecture is Writing the Ship, Systemic Flaws in the Biomedical Research Enterprise. And I, I want to begin by giving you a sense of how I came to being interested in the, what I think are truly systemic flaws right now in what is happening in the large biomedical enterprise. And, and I'm going to start with really a Dickensian moment. And the Dickensian moment is that there is um, a sense right now that we are both in the best of times and we are in the worst of times in biomedical research. So let me give you a sense of the best of times. And I suspect many of you in the audience are writing about this on a weekly, if not daily, basis. So when I left my laboratory in 2001 to become the president of Princeton, I had to leave behind the world that I had known for my entire professional career, which is um, basic fundamental research in molecular genetics. 
And I couldn't really pay attention for the next 12 years while I was president. And so when I came back to my department in 2013, and I began to attend seminars and read the literature and see what was going on, it was just simply stunning to me how much had happened in the 12 years that I was away. Now, some of what had happened was clearly technological. There were, you know, the discovery and, oops, sorry, the discovery and the use of um, gene editing tools like Cas9 that, that have not simply affected fundamental biology by making genetics now available for literally every organism on the planet but it is also having profound effects already on the potential for treating human disease. It's an extraordinary advance that no one could have predicted in advance. But there are others as well. I think what has happened in the uh, use of the immune system to attract cancer is, uh, as shown up here on the activated T cell, is something that we've been talking about for 30 years. 30 years we thought that that was something if only we could mobilize our own immune system. Now it seems like it is finally coming to fruition. Advances in biological imaging. I mean, whether we are imaging neurons in live animals as they conduct work, as they do tasks, or whether it is the kind of imaging that we now have available to us through cryo-EM, where we are able to solve the structures of very large biological complexes at a rate that would have been impossible to imagine uh, in uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, to the resurrection of fields. So one of my favorite examples of this is metabolism. So I was a graduate student at the time when metabolism was a very active field of research. It literally disappeared for 25 years, but, um, we now, through the use of mass spectrometry, we're now bringing back why metabolism is actually so incredibly important. Um, genomics has obviously revolutionized so much of not just uh, the questions that we can ask that we could never ask before, but questions that we've been asking, but we now have a new way of asking those questions. Um, you know, the, 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 the amazing work that we are doing with, with understanding the microbiome. We were barely aware of the importance of gut uh, microbes uh, until fairly recently. So if, as a scientist, when I looked at what I saw when I came back, all, my most strong reaction was this is the most exciting time I can ever remember in science. So, with all of, if all of that is true, then why does it sometimes feel like it is the worst of times? And this is captured by a cartoon in Science Magazine uh, several years ago. So as I began having conversations with my colleagues, what I was hearing was demoralization, discouragement, risk aversion, and Perhaps most critically, most importantly, in terms of the welfare of the field, I was hearing a lack of confidence that the field was fair, that grant reviews were fair, that publishing papers was fair, that being able to uh, 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 have a career that you had originally uh, designed for yourself, all of these, a lack of sense that the playing field was fair. And this is really what led uh, me to begin having conversations with people who, who had lived their lives in biomedical research. And Alan mentioned several of them. Uh, Bruce Alberts, the former president of the National Academy. Harold Farmus, who at the time was the NCI director at the NIH. And uh, Mark Kirchner, who um, is, is the chair of systems biology at Harvard. And, We'd, we'd known each other a long time. We'd been together in many contexts for many, many years. And we all came to the same conclusion that this feels like the best and the worst of times. And to understand, we, we began to ask what's wrong. And I think to understand what's wrong, we have to go back to the beginning and to this uh, man, Vannevar Bush, 
who was science advisor to both President Roosevelt and then President Truman uh, in the Second World War and in the aftermath. And I think many of you know this story. It's a, it's a famous story where Bush wrote, was asked to sort of think through what science was going to look like after the Second World War, and particularly what the role of the federal government was going to be in supporting science. And he wrote this marvelous report called Science the Endless Frontier that really laid out the groundwork, the, the fundamental groundwork for our scientific enterprise today. And the first thing he said, really critical, is that fundamental basic discovery is critical to any scientific advance that the nation could take advantage of in, in the future. And this is just one of the many quotes from this report. One of the peculiarities of basic science is the variety of paths which lead to productive advance. Many of the most important discoveries have come as a result of experiments undertaken with very different purposes in mind. The, this whole report is basically a plea for the importance of fundamental research. He then went on to say that it was important that the government support basic research and provide incentives to the private sector to fund applied and uh, research and development. In other words, what he was describing was an ecosystem where, where each part of the ecosystem, whether it was um, the federally funded research or whether it was the private sector, had to work together effectively. He also said something that I think was non-intuitive at the time, and that is federal support should be directed toward research universities, academic medical centers, and research institutes, not federal labs. And the reason that was so counterintuitive is because that's where the bulk of federally funded research uh, was happening at the time of the Second World War, obviously with the development of the atomic bomb, uh, but in other ways as well. So, so the notion that you wouldn't just grow these federal labs was not uh, obvious, I think. But the reason, the reason, the brilliant reason that Bush supported the idea that the research would not happen in federal labs, but happen in universities. And he provo proposed that the conduct of research should be tied to the education of future scientists, graduate students. I mean, the least, you know, the least experienced of us all, uh, graduate students, and then he said something very important, and, and this goes to the heart of some of the problems that we now face. But only that proportion of the youthful talent appropriate to the needs of science. And, and with the, uh, Science the Endless Frontier, we really laid out the, the game plan for how the government would support science. And you can really see this in this figure, which begins in 1953 and goes all the way to about 2016, where we're looking at non-defense R&D by function in the federal government. And you can see that in the first few years, there was a massive increase in federal support. The other thing you can see is how little federal support there was until after the Second World War, something that is often not appreciated. Now, you can see that it wasn't a constant exponential increase by any means. Um, there, there was a big buildup in the uh, late 50s, early 60s that was a direct result of Sputnik. And, and therefore, the beneficiary was largely the space program, which is the yellow bars. You can see that there was another sort of increase um, at the time of the energy crisis in the 70s. And again, the, the major beneficiary in this case was the Department of Energy. But the other thing you can see in, in this slide is that there was one massive winner in terms of funds, in terms of science, and that are the blue bars, and that is the National Institutes of Health, as well as uh, health research that was being supported by some of the other agencies, although at a much, much lower level than what you see at the NIH. Now, what this slide shows, and we're looking sort of at, at the same uh, data, but we're looking at them in terms of who received the funds 
from the federal government. And in this case, the only point I want you to, to, to um, emphasize here is that the gray bars are clearly the winners in terms of federal funding, and uh, that is university. So Bush's proposal that the majority of the funds should go to places that were training future scientists uh, was, was also um, continued to be carried out. Now, one of the things that I showed you in the last slide is this little exclamation mark that I didn't comment on. But this exclamation mark uh, represents one of the underlying causes of the, of the tensions that we now see in biomedical research. And that's obvious that, that there was both rapid increases and decreases in funding over a very short period of time. And that is reflected here um, in this slide, where we're looking from about 2000 up to 2017. And the blue bars represent inflation-adjusted dollars uh, that, that were available to the NIH. And, and many of you know the story now that, that during, from the years 1998 to 2003, there was a doubling of the NIH budget. This is when my friend Harold Varmas was the director of the NIH. And he is, um, was clearly a very strong advocate for the doubling. And so what you're seeing here in those early years is you're seeing the very, very dramatic increase in NIH funding. But as most of my political scientist friends would now tell me was highly predictable, which was that by the end of 2003, when the doubling had been completed, there was a sense on Capitol Hill that we had taken care of biomedical research. We don't want to hear from them again. They, they've got their doubling. We have to now pay attention to other things. There was, of course, the Iraq War that was also uh, draining resources away from the non-defense budget. And really, beginning in 2004, the spending power of the NIH declined. And it declined pretty uh, consistently through the 2000s all the way to uh, 2015. And this seesaw nature of rapid increases followed, followed by pretty significant declines to the point where the spending power in 2015 was not fundamentally different than the spending power in 2000, is, is one of the, the, the problems uh, that has led to what I am going to now tell you about. So while the NIH was seeing a 20%, 26% increase over a period of 17 years, so that's, that's less than 2% than per year, what was happening to the training of new graduate students? And so what we're looking here is, is the production of graduate students basically over roughly the same period of time. And um, the, the red squares are biomedical scientists. The, the blue uh, uh, diamonds are total life sciences. The point here is that we continue to produce significant numbers and increasing numbers of graduate students through this period. In fact, the increase was 50%, which was twice as much as the, what was happening to NIH funding over this same period of time. Not only that, but as any good university administrator will tell you, when there is the sense that there are new resources, the first thing a university uh, administrator, whether it's a dean of a medical school or a president of a university, wants to be able to take advantage of that increase and begin to build. So what you're seeing in this slide is in the blue uh, circles represent the increase in NIH funding. So you can see the doubling now very clearly, followed by the decline in inflation-adjusted dollars over the next uh, 15 years. And what you're seeing in the yellow, in the orange, rather, circles is you're seeing what happened to assignable square feet of research space in those universities and research institutes that were the recipients of NIH funding. 
And you can see that in the early days, they were pretty aligned in terms of the rate of increase of NIH funds and, and assignable square feet. But the doubling basically got them out of whack with one another to the point that today now um, research space is basically being built at a rate which is 64% increase during the same period where the NIH budget had increased only 26%. So again, a misalignment. Now, what these misalignments between the number of scientists we're producing and the amount of space that we are generating has produced what I have called a Malthusian dilemma. And you will all recall Thomas Malthus. Uh, he was one of our earliest demographers. And uh, made the very simple uh, argument that we, that supply and demand have to be in equilibrium with one another when, when basically um, the population increases at a rate that is faster than the resources that are capable of supporting it, you will hit a point of crisis. And I think at the end of the day, that's really what's happened to biomedical research. They have encountered a Malthusian crisis. And the evidence for the Malthusian crisis is very uh, clear, at least to me. Here we have, we're looking at the inevitable impact uh, on, uh, in the blue bars, we're looking at the number of people applying for NIH funding over the period of the doubling on to today. But the number of awards stayed relatively constant which are the green uh, bars. And the consequence is that the success rate fell during this period and has stayed at a level that many of us think is below what is needed for the system to function effectively. Now, this Malthusian dilemma has been most, uh, I think, challenging for the youngest among us. Um, because it is a, essentially created a bulge in the training pipeline. So in the 70s and 80s, I would argue, we had a very good alignment between the number of scientists we were producing and the number of positions that were available where they could effectively use that very um, uh, demanding education that they had just received. And I'm going to show you some data that clearly I think make the case that we now have a bulging pipeline. We have fewer positions than we have people aspiring to them. And the consequence is that training has become longer and longer and longer. And some of the evidence for this is, is, is to look at what has happened demographically uh, to uh, uh, NIH recipients of grants, and in the light blue bars that you can see beginning on the left are the age distribution of NIH grant recipients in 1980. So I got my first grant in 1978, and I was uh, someplace around the peak in terms of age of that light blue set of bars. In the, the same uh, data in 2014, you can see what has happened to the curve. The curve has mo moved very significantly to the right. Uh, there are many fewer young people, and there are m significantly more people who are uh, at more advanced stages in their careers. And that's reflected in the red lines on the left-hand side in 1980 and on the right-hand side in 2014. And just, just to give you a sense of the numbers, because I think what we're looking there are percentages, but to look at what has happened to the numbers, what, what I've uh, shown in this slide is the number of NIH um, uh, principal investigators who are age 35 and younger in the blue lines, beginning in 1980 and finishing in 2014. So there I was in 1980. I was one of those people who was under the age of 35. Uh, and there were 2,623 of us at that point. Today, there are 662 NIH grantees who are under the age of 35, despite the fact that total number 
has dramatically increased. And you can see that the reciprocal graph is showing what has happened to investigators who are over the 66 or older. And you can see that their population has increased tenfold. So that the average age of an investigator receiving his first grant is now uh, over the age of 40. Now, back to the space issue for a minute. Um, as uh, the amount of space was, was being expanded at many universities, academic medical centers, um, the pressure became to fill that space. That space had to be filled. And one of the things that, that began to increase during this period when, when space was being generated faster than there were funds at universities to pay for them is an increase in the rise in soft money. These are individuals who are working at largely academic medical centers who are uh, asked to raise not only their research funds, which had always been the case, but now in addition their salaries as well. And so the soft money comes from the uh, expectation that you will put a very significant fraction, if not all of your salary, on a research grant. Now, from a university administration perspective, that's a really sensible policy, because salaries that are supported on NIH funds bring in indirect cost recovery. Salaries that are paid by the universities or the academic medical centers do not get an, uh, indirect cost recovery. So it's a, it's a strategic thing for a university to do, but it has very negative consequences for the grant system in general. Because if you have to put your salary on a grant, it automatically means that you are going to have less spending power to conduct the research on that grant. Most grants have a relatively fixed budget. And therefore, to do the same amount of science, you're going to have to have more grants. So not only do you have um, uh, more people in the system, but each one needs more NIH funds in order to just conduct their work. And when uh, we had a meeting at Howard Hughes a few years ago to talk about all of this with a group of, um, of our colleagues in the field, uh, David Baltimore uh, at Caltech uh, managed to summarize everything that I've said in the last 20 minutes as there are too many people chasing too little money. And that basically is the cause of the worst of times. So what are the consequences of this? And, and here's where I think we now come to why we should care about this at all. Um, we have made an, an argument that there is a mismatch now between supply and demand. And what it has created is a hyper-competitive environment within biomedical research. Now, I've lived my whole life competing, competing for positions, for students, for grants, for getting my papers into journals. Um, so it's, competition is not the problem. The problem is hyper-competition, and the reason why hypercompetition is a problem is because it leads to risk aversion. And risk aversion is not, um, is antithetical to good science, I would say. If you're not prepared to take risks, you're going to do very um, sort of the kind of science that dots I's and crosses T's, but is not going to break open a whole new field. And then the thing that I observed over and over again at Princeton as I talked to students about, uh, particularly undergraduates, about what they wanted to do with their careers, uh, it became increasingly obvious to me that many of our very best students who should be going to graduate school were choosing not to because they did not see that the system was fair. They did not believe that if they had devoted anywhere from you know, 10 to 12 years of their adult life before they had any chance of being one of the 15% who will actually be able to do their own research in an academic setting. Um, it just, they're, they're, they just had other options. So I think the two things we have been most concerned about is 
the risk taking and the ability to attract the next generation. And as Alan said, uh, that led uh, Bruce, Mark, and Harold and I to write this PNAS paper in 2014, which we are horrified to believe is the most cited paper we've ever written. <laughs> That's really depressing, right? Really depressing. Uh, but it did get a lot of attention. Uh, and um, basically, in this paper, we tried to lay out what we saw was the problem and at least begin the conversation about some things that we could do about it. We were not the only people doing this by any stretch of the imagination. There ha were lots of studies, some of which were being conducted at the NIH, some of which were being conducted at the National Research Council. Um, uh, here on the, on the top, a, a generation at risk, uh, Ron Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins, who is not a scientist, he's a constitutional lawyer, uh, but because he has a large medical center, he was very, began to be really worried about the issues. So, so it is not that this wasn't something that people were worried about. It was that there was no sort of focus um, to begin to uh, attack some of the issues. And that did lead us, whoops, to establish uh, this little NGO, which is really an advocacy organization called Rescuing Biomedical Research. We've been really lucky in being able to attract a, a broad array of individuals to be part of RBR. Uh, some of them, like Ron Daniels and Freeman Rabowski at UMBC are university presidents. Some, like Nancy Andrews, is a former dean of the medical school at Duke. Uh, Rush Holt, uh, as all of you probably know, is the current president of AAAS. Jeremy Berg, who's the editor-in-chief uh, at Science. Um, and a whole variety of both uh, more senior and junior people who were willing to come together and to think about how could we begin to, to catalyze conversations in the field about how to address some of these issues. We are funded by a, 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 a philanthropy in California called Open Philanthropy and the Rita Allen Foundation. Uh, but we really only have one, we don't have a lot of money, but we have one thing we can do and that's convene. So I want to tell you about a couple of things we've done that I think have begun to address around the edges some of the central issues we're worried about. So uh, this is really a project that Jessica Polka um, a member of RBR, Ron Vale at UCSF on the right, and Harold took on, which is a real concern about what is happening to scientific publication. As, as, the, as the ability to publish your work was becoming more and more competitive, uh, work was simply not appearing in public. It was being uh, often uh, delayed, sometimes by multiple years, and uh, as, as Harold and Ron and Jessica began to think about what we could do about it, there was already a very uh, nascent effort underway already to increase the use of uh, bioarchives, archives where one could post a paper before it has been reviewed and, um, and at least get it out in the public domain. This is very much consistent with Harold's interest over a long period of time in open science. Um, so we convened a meeting of, of journals, of um, funders, of scientists who are on both sides of the archive argument. Um, Howard Hughes was able to provide a place for us to do this. And out of it came uh, an organization that we've spun off from RBR called ASAP Bio. Uh, and we're extremely optimistic that bioarchives are going to be able to sort of release some of the publication pressure so that people can get their work out there, which after all, this should be our goal uh, as we publish science. So that's a, that's a case where what it took was a group willing to bring people together and to talk through what's, what the issues would be. And there are, I don't mean to underestimate that there were issues around bioarchives. But, but I see increasingly, as I go to seminars, people saying, oh, this is on bioarchives. You can see it. So I think this is, this is a success. 
Here's another one, and I want to give real credit to Ron Daniels at Johns Hopkins and to Mary Sue Coleman, who's the current president of the American Association of, Re of Universities, which are the largest 62, 63 research universities in the country. And, and that is that if we are going to continue to train graduate students at a rate that exceeds um, the ability for us to fund them, at least within the biomedical enterprise, we need to be more, much more transparent about what career outcomes are for graduate students program by program by program across the country. This is something that Mary Sue did when she was the president at the University of Michigan. And I've actually taken these screenshots from the uh, University of Mi Michigan website, where for every department in the whole university, they lay out um, what is the enrollment information by program, as well as the career outcomes by program. And what the University of Michigan tells us is that this has actually increased their competitiveness for graduate students because the students are happy to go to a place that will tell them you know, what their odds are and what they should be thinking about as they think about their careers. Um, Ron is on there because in order to kickstart this, he put together what he calls a coalition of the willing, which are a group of universities who committed to do this. And now Mary Sue has taken the coalition of the willing and expanded it to all AAU institutions. So I think this is an issue um, that is, is one where we've had, I think, um, real success. Uh, another issue that uh, uh, we are working hard on is how, how do we want to fund young investigators? How do we want to give them the sense that they can take some risks, that they can start new projects? They don't have to just continue to do what they did as postdoctoral fellows. And we have some interesting models in Europe that I think are, would be very good for the United States to uh, begin to think about. So uh, a number of us wrote this policy forum in, in trying to think about what are, the or what are the qualities of a grant program that would give young investigators their best shot at having successful scientific careers. But these three things that I've just told you about really are, are issues on the periphery of what is at the core problem the core systemic flaw that I've been talking about. And I think until we don't look at this hard and address it, we will, we will make little baby steps, but we're not going to really do any serious reform. And, and this is my effort to put in one slide what I think is the key issue for us as a field. So on the left-hand side is a Malthusian laboratory structure. Biology has, until the Genome Project, always been cottage industry. It has always been a single principal investigator, maybe one or two staff scientists, but the vast majority of the labor that it took to do science was being done by either graduate students or postdoctoral fellows. And that led directly to the Malthusian dilemma. We were producing more of these future scientists than we could really absorb effectively into the system. And our argument is this isn't sustainable. So what, what could replace it? And, and actually, although what I'm about to describe is challenging, I actually think it's starting to happen, which is I, I began the lecture by telling you about all these amazing technologies that have been developed so that we can ask new questions. But what I didn't say is those technologies are not things that each individual PI is going to be able to develop in his or her own lab. A lot of them are large um, uh, machines that, that need uh, expert people running those machines, and, and a lot of um, a lot of the science is going to be done this way going forward. And that's what I'm trying to re represent by these circles, where I put in each one of the circles a major, major technology that a lab is going to need but cannot have replicated individually in their own lab. 
whether it's microscopy, mass spec, data analysis is a big one, genomics, genome modification, metabolomics. The, these are going to most optimally exist as what I call innovation platforms. And they are going to be run not by graduate students and postdocs. They are going to be run by professional scientists whose careers, as they think about what they want to do in their career, they want to make uh, advances in the platform technology that they are responsible for. And that's why I put all these staff scientists all the way around these, each one of the circles. Now, if that's really how science ends up getting done, we will need fewer trainees because a lot of the work is going to be done in these cores. So we can begin to reduce the average size of the laboratory, although we will not decrease the quantity, and I would argue the quality of the science that they are able to produce. So that's the challenge ahead. The challenge is ahead is to make a major cultural change in the way we organize our science. Now, it's happening. It's happening already in some places around the country and in Europe. The Broad Institute is perhaps the very best example at MIT and Harvard, where the work at the Broad is really organized around these very, very um, challenging technologies that are being run by a professional staff at the Broad. Uh, and people can come in and out of the Broad as they need that technology. Uh, Janelia Farms at HHMI is, has a very similar structure. And Chan Zuckerberg, which has just started up the biohub out in the Bay Area, is, is organizing itself in exactly that way. And here's an example at uh, the Cambridge Institute in the UK where they have done exactly the same thing. They have, have built their, their culture around innovation hubs. And, and the consequence is you will not need the same kind of intense labor force that you needed in the past. And you will provide wonderful career opportunities for people who want to work on technology, work on innovating technology as collaborators with the scientists at these institutions. Now, those of you who know these institutions will immediately recognize the problem. And that is that all of these have fungible philanthropic dollars that they can use to get these kinds of laboratory structures up and running. So a big challenge for us, and one that we're, we're just really trying to understand is how, how the NIH is going to have to change the way it thinks about funding science so that um, it, this kind of structure will not simply occur at very well-funded, privately funded research institutes, but could happen in any uh, university or academic medical center around the country. So uh, I have called this. Uh, writing the ship, and, and uh, this picture I have in the middle is what we're trying to prevent, um, which is you know uh, 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 being unable to write the ship and the implications for uh, f failing to write the ship to the people who were involved in the enterprise. And the, the reason why we are working so hard on these questions is that I'm going to come back to the very beginning of the talk. And the reason is because the science is really exciting right now. There is so much to be done. There are so many interesting questions that we could have only dreamed about asking uh, 15 years ago. But we need an environment where we are attracting um, students into this field because they think it, there's an opportunity to make a contribution. And we want to have scientists within the system who feel secure enough and comfortable enough that they can take risks um, to use some of these technologies and to ask some of the questions, the deep, deep questions that are there to be had. So I'm going to conclude there. And I would be um, more than delighted to answer any questions or hear your reactions to the talk as well. Thank you very much for your attention.
And there are microphones, I guess, down at the front. Right, so. right. We have the system worked out. So just come down to All the right. microphones here and, uh, and ask your question in the form of a question. Form of a question. Yes, hi, Beryl Benderly from Science Couriers. <laughs> And I'm wondering of these scientists who are, or the people who are running all the technologies, what's their status yeah. going to be in the yeah. university? So that, that is, I'm, th I'm really glad you answered, asked that question. Um, the institutions that have already adopted this structure are, have, have dealt with this question. So I don't think it's insolvable. Um, and if you look at places like Janilia Farms and the Broad, what I've been told at both of those institutions is that the people who are um, most difficult to retain are the people who are running their innovation platforms. Um, that these are incredibly talented people who, who are being compensated, and that's really key, who are being compensated as though they were really, really talented scientists, which they are and who see that this is a really exciting way to have a scientific career. So I think we already have uh, examples that we can look to, but I, I agree with you completely that universities are gonna have to solve this issue. Um, you know, the, the, what used to be called, and I try and avoid common facilities, because common facilities in the past were often um, service organizations simply serve as, you know, you give me your DNA, I'll give you back your sequence. Um, we're not talking about those old versions of core facilities. We're talking about people who were running the genomics core and were trying to figure out new ways to do single cell RNA seq because that's what everybody in the community is dying to see. So it's a different, completely different way of thinking about the function of these facilities. I guess we should go one or the other. All right, right. Hi, I'm Gene Russo from PNAS. Uh, I also spent a number of years in the, uh, editing the career section at Nature. So um, one problem you've seemed to imply is a sort of political problem, and that's that if the money's there, NIH is compelled to take it. So if you have, then you have the doubling, and then later you have the bust. So I guess right. my question is, how, how can we address that? How, I mean, it's hard yeah. for an NIH director to say, no, no, don't give us the money. Maybe it's better, though, if we have that 5% every year, let's say. Yes. Um, but then, because otherwise we get at the Bourne, what Henry Bourne was describing, that was a piece that was in my section I helped, helped shepherd. And then, then we have these incredible problems. But, uh, so, but it seems intractable, because it seems hard to tell yeah. the NIH director not to lobby for that, or et cetera. Um. So there, there are two, I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question in two very different ways. One is I think if Harold Varmus were standing here right today, he would argue, um, who, who was the author of the doubling, that the NIH did not prepare for the end to the doubling. They, you know, it was happy days are here again, and no one was anticipating two or three years in advance. What are we going to do? We've got all these commitments. What are we going to do? So I think some of the answer to your question is we need to be um, thinking years ahead, no matter whether we're doubling or whether it's flat or going down. The second thing, um, and this is something we're actually working on right now at RBR, um, which is to adopt a practice that exists for some of the Department of Defense's uh, research programs, which is five-year projections. And we know you are not going to be able to accomplish this by having uh, the House agree that they are going to give you your budget for the next five years. But, and they don't do that for the DOD either. But what they do do is they allow every year to have a rolling five projection so that everyone's head is focused in on how can we ensure that there is um, not seesaw funding, but you know, whether it's like this or whether it's like this or this, let's think ahead to what the implications are going to be. So we're actually trying to write a paper right now about exactly that kind of question. Great question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mallory Pickett. I'm a freelance writer. Um, and I was curious whether your group has looked into this or if you have any thoughts on the, you talked about the sort of bulging pipeline and people spending longer in training, yeah. how that affects the retention of women. 
Yeah, I, I, um, some of what I'm going to say is data-based and some of it is opinion-based. And I, <laughs> I, I, I just want to be clear that I'm probably mixing and matching a yeah. little bit here. I think it has a profound effect on women. I'll give you one data point that, that, that gives you a sense of this. Um, women now earn over 50% of the PhDs in life sciences today. When we uh, put in an advertisement for uh, an assistant professorship at Princeton, the pool is 25% women. So we Recently, lose. like now. Like today. Yeah. And this, and this is not something that's, that's uh, Princeton specific. This is across the board at, at most of these AAU institutions. So we lose half of the women between the time they receive their PhD and the time that they are applying for faculty jobs. And I can't but believe that some fraction of that is because we are extending their training period, which means low income, right. for uh, a critical period in their life. Okay. Do you, sorry, can I ask one quick sure. follow-up? Do you sure. know if anyone has looked at in the past if retention of women was different, I mean, it, like 90s or 80s, there's obviously fewer women overall, but if the retention was better? Yeah, I, I haven't gone back to see what that fraction that is, um, let's say, in 1980. But, okay. but I think you're going to run into trouble because there were so few of right. us, right, in 1980. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Jang. I'm a writer at Harvard Medical School. Um, thank you so much for that talk. That was super fascinating. Um, I was wondering if um, it seems to me, at least in Boston and uh, the Bay Area in recent years, um, the private sector has kind of been a relief valve for the training uh, bulge that you were talking about. Um, you know, biopharma has just really boomed um, right. in the greater Boston area. Um, and I was just wondering, yeah, what, what do you think the effect of that is on the biomedical enterprise, especially as um, places like, you know, Novartis start have um, really taken up a lot of the staff slack in kind of basic mm -hmm. science discovery. Ah, wait a minute. You just said something that was not true. No. Novartis <laughs> has not taken up the oh. slack for basic research funding. There is not a pharmaceutical country uh, company in the world that sees one of their missions to do basic fundamental science. They still are looking to us in the universities to do it. But, um, Boston may be anomalous in terms of employment because if you look at national statistics, employment across whether you're looking at biotech or pharma has not um, absorbed the excess that cannot be absorbed by academic institutions, for example. Um, you know, Boston, as you know, is right now in a very hot period for, for uh, pharma and biotech. Um, but if you look nationally, it doesn't support us. And if, if I could just use your question to, to talk about something very briefly that I, that I ignored in the talk for the sake of brevity, but I think it's really important to say, and that is um, one of the things that the NIH has encouraged and many institutions have now adopted is a much more open-minded view about what career options should be for PhDs in biomedical science. So many, many institutions in the country now do everything they can to, um, you know, to educate graduate students that, they, that, that um, there are lots of ways to use a PhD, including, I suspect, a lot of people in this audience. Um, and, and the notion that you come into graduate school expecting that you will then go on to be you know, a principal investigator, NIH funded at some academic institution, that's actually become an alternative career. 15% is the number right now. And so I think this is a very healthy thing. As long as we really are persuaded that there are jobs out there that can take advantage of the long training that many of them have undergone. Yeah. Thank you. You actually just answered my question about <laughs> expanding the, the yeah. scope of what we can consider to be um, a yeah. post-PhD career. But if you would permit me one suggestion. Yeah. Your slide where you talk about the structure of science. Um, you have a very diverse trainee pool, and you have images of two yes, crazy-looking white men. I know. And even on the side where there are a lot more technical staff yeah. scientists, they're all crazy-looking white men. It would be great, actually. I mean, I know it's a tiny thing. They're just little cartoon images no, on the no, slide. No. But um, those images can really matter. women in there. <laughs> exactly. I, I completely agree with you. 
I'm going to fix that slide today. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Jackie, and I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, my husband and I both started grad school in 2003, so we are both <laughs> not PIs. <laughs> um, yeah. He's actually a staff scientist. But I was really interested in the slide you had of the age of uh, um, NIH grantees yes. in 1980 versus now. And can you speak a little bit about why there's been such a huge increase in the number of PIs over 66? I mean, are PIs just staying longer? Do they have a disproportionate number of grants? Like, um, why do they account for such a huge part of the pool? Um, the answer really goes back to the 1990s when um, the, the Congress passed uh, the age discrimination laws that said that universities cannot have a retirement age for its faculty. And you know, literally from that, I think that was passed in 1994. And from then on, universities could do nothing to encourage. They, they, you could sort of have programs, but you couldn't have a conversation with an individual saying, we think it's really time that you think about retiring. So, so I think that's one of, one of the things. I think the second thing is that, you know, the, the, old, the famous thing, you know, 70 is the new 50. You know, we are living longer. We are more fit than, uh, than we were 25 years ago, 50 years ago. So I think some fraction of it is that people who continue to be productive into their 70s, and in some cases I know of 80s, um, and can still, you know, um, have research grants and train students. Um, you know, it's hard to make an argument that they shouldn't be having um, that opportunity, except the one exception is that if you ask, when do scientists do the most path-breaking work of their careers? It is someplace between the mid-30s and the mid-40s for almost all fields of science. And if we have a demographic that looks like that, where we're basically almost missing that demographic, um, that's a problem. I think it's a problem. We have to recognize it's a problem. I think a lot of the young PIs that I know feel like this fairness issue that maybe more senior PIs get more grants than more junior faculty. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's certainly how they feel. So here's the data. Here are the data. The data are that the NIH worried a lot about this in beginning around 2005, 2006. So now they track very carefully the success rate of first time PIs versus returning PIs. And, and they have now pretty much equalized the success rate. The difference is how many grants you have. And the more senior investigators are the investigators who have more and more of those grants. That's the difference, yeah. We have a couple of minutes left, so I think we're going to go into the lightning round, because I can tell that there are going to be some good questions coming yeah, up. I'm uh, Judy Randall, a freelancer, and I'm wondering if you've considered the effect of this on the undergraduate and even the high school population, where there's been so much emphasis on getting parents to get their kids to aspire to STEM education. Yeah. Yeah. And this has been at the expense of humanities faculties on many undergraduate colleges, for example. And in my county, we have just built a specialized STEM education high school. I think maybe a lot of people are destined to disappointment. I wonder what you think. <laughs> so it, it, that's a, it's a very, very important question. Um, and I would be uncomfortable suggesting that we should not be encouraging um, high school students and early undergraduates in at least contemplating the possibility of a career in science. I think, I think sending them a different message at that age is wrong. Um, the other thing I would say is that, and, and speaking to this audience, I think I'm speaking to the choir here, is that we need a scientific, scientifically literate citizenry. We do not have that at the moment. I think we would all agree that we do not have that at the moment. And so the, the notion of discouraging young people from at least taking science courses, thinking about science, 
um, it strikes me as problematic. Where I come down on your question, though, I come down with uh, what I said a few minutes ago about the project that Ron Daniels and Mary Sue Coleman have really, I think, kick-started, which is let's be really open and honest. From the moment a student is thinking about applying to a graduate program, let's let them know what, you know, what the career options are. And I suspect if we do this, and we do it in a really honest way, that we are going to have lots of graduate students who are beginning graduate school saying, I want to be a science writer. That's what I actually really you want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you have your own career path issues too. <laughs> but, but, but in other words, that they are going to be much more intelligent about how they think about pursuing their graduate career when they know here are all the things you can do. Um, and the, the sooner you can figure out which of those is the one you want to aim for, the more likely you're going to end up where you want to be. Great. Hi, uh, Richard Harris from NPR. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, when I was an undergraduate in the University of California in the 1970s, I think the state of California provided most of the funding for UC. Now I think the campuses get maybe 5 or 10%, yeah. which is leading to the problem of the soft money that you alluded yeah. to. Is this a problem? Is this something that you can attack? Have you thought about this? Is there anything to be done about that? Or is that just too bad that was, that was then, this is now? Um, so Henry Bourne, who is one of our collaborators at RBR, has been thinking about this a lot. Um, I actually think we have to get it under control. I think, it's, I think it's toxic, and it creates toxic environments within the places that actually depend to a very large extent on soft money. So I think, I think the answer has to ultimately come from the NIH, to be honest. I think they've either got to lower the, the absolute dollar amount that they're willing to pay for a faculty salary. They've got to e either do that, or they've got to um, cap the total percentage that they're willing to pay. Or the thing that would end it tomorrow, no more indirect cost recovery on faculty salaries. So you equalize, right? Because that's a huge incentive to institutions, huge incentive to put more salary on, on research grants. So I think there are strategies. I think it politically it will be very, very challenging. Thank you. Okay. Alan. Uh, and oh, uh, okay. I, I want to get, we can go into a couple minutes of overtime, but we're okay. down to it. Thank you. Alan Brown, mechanical engineering, so I'm obviously the outlier here. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, but the question is an outlier question. I look at your description of something like the Broad or Jamalia Farms, and the first thing I think is these are really multidisciplinary organizations. You know, you can have a grad student in, in a lab and they cludge something together, but at Broad, a Broad you're not going to get that. You've got to have real engineers, you've got to have physicists, you've got to have specialists in these other fields. First of all, are they really going to be able to absorb the grad students that are out there now? And second of all, it, you know, when you look at Germany, they've got a whole level of institutes that are devoted specifically to applied research that we don't have here. Everybody here is theoretical. And so there's not really a career path you know, for somebody who is going to not be at one of those institutes, but apply what's done in those institutes, or perhaps you know, even create an institute with a revolving door like they do in Germany. So you come in, you do several years of work, and then somebody says, wow, you're really valuable. Let me throw a ton of money at you and come to me. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of multidisciplinarity, it's here. It's, it's the way biology is going to be done, I think, in the future. It's inconceivable to me, to be honest, that biology would persist isolated from the other disciplines. They are going to call upon engineers. They're calling, they, they're absolutely dependent on computer scientists now uh, and mathematicians, right? You can't, yeah. you can't do anything if, it, if you don't have one of those as one of your collaborators. So it's already happening. And I think the places that figure out how to create interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary environments where everyone 
is valued. Everyone's expertise is brought to the table. Each one of us will always still have hardcore disciplinary knowledge, but, but we'll be able to work together as teams are the places that are going to do the most fascinating science, I think. Great, yes. great. Uh, let's do the, the I really want to get <laughs> these last two questions in. So, yeah. and Hi, Jennifer Huber, freelance, although I'm one of those people that were cut, came off the boat, although I'd say I half jump, half fell. <laughs> um, I was a research scientist for most of my career. And I'm wondering if you've addressed one issue that I've seen, because I even still review grants for multiple agencies, including NIH. And they have these mechanisms that are supposed to be, well, are, are for young scientists, a young career. But I find that in reality, they're really not reviewed any differently. And I think that's why, in part, the age yeah. graph exists is, in theory, you're supposed to be reviewed differently. But in practice, there's a big pile of figurative grants, and they're all reviewed against each other. Yeah. So there are, by the way, there are NIH grants that are reviewed separately for young investigators. Yeah. Um, they're, they're called ESIs. They're, uh, um, there's a whole series of them. The problem with them is they are tiny in yeah. number. But like R01s yeah. and stuff are. So one of the things we say in that policy form that we published in Science is about how to fund young investigators is we make the argument we think that, that two things, one that should be easy, one that's hard. The easy thing is they should be reviewed separately. Yeah. Okay. They, you know, because the, the way you think about a seasoned investigator's grant is just different than the way you think about a young investigator. What we really like about the yeah, European Research Council is they designate a certain amount of money, which the NIH has never done for young investigators. And that, that is a smart way to say we need a pipeline that's moving smoothly through career stages, from early stage to mid stage to, to senior stage. I won't call it late stage, but senior stage. Um, but so I'm. I'm I agree with you that 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 gives that gives a much better sense of 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 who are you, who do you want to invest in for the future? Department of Defense Cancer Program is better at it. <laughs> is that about doing it for NIH? They oh, they said a okay. certain percent. Okay, yeah, thank that's, you. Actually, yeah. thank you for telling me that because <laughs> great. We're looking and for the last arguments. question. Yeah, Hi, Kathy Guerra, freelancer. Um, I'm wondering how, and it probably varies from institution to institution, but how is the size of the incoming graduate class determined? <laughs> and could that piece of the equation be tweaked? Yeah. Um, when we wrote our PNAS paper in 2014, we had actually proposed that there needed to be birth control. And, and we used actually the example in physics. So when the superconducting super collider was canceled in the 90s, the particle physics community nationwide made a decision they, they had to reduce graduate admissions because one of the major sources of funding had just disappeared. Um, we were killed by our colleagues for suggesting it. I mean, of all the things we said in that PNAS paper, that was the most incendiary. And their argument is as follows, and I think they have some merit. Their argument is, how well do you think you predict the, the ultimate success of a graduate student based on their graduate application? And so several places actually went and did the experiment. And it turns out we're not very good at that. We're not very good at predicting who is actually going to um, you know, succeed as a scientist, as a professional scientist. So that gave us some pause about, about how to think about whether that should be where the, the narrowing is. So we've now, I think, uh, agreed pretty much on a proposal that Keith Yamamoto at UCSF proposed for a long time, which is keep the funnel pretty wide at the level of graduate school give them lots of career counseling, career options, but then tighten it at the postdoc level. And the problem with biomedical science right now is that the postdoc is almost you know, sort of the de facto, this is what you do. And, and so we're trying to make the argument that, that 
if we're doing a good job of presenting graduate students with all their career options, only a fraction of those options actually benefit from a postdoc. So many fewer students should be going on to postdocs. So that's kind of where we are with that issue. Well, thank you thank so you much, Dr. Kelvin.